What a great opportunity we have once again this morning to open the Word of God together. And of course, as you know, this is our first Sunday of the month. We will be partaking in communion together here in just a short bit. But before we do that, I'll ask you to take your Bibles and open them with me to our study of the book of Jude. Jude. I'm continually amazed at the providence of God. I probably shouldn't be as a Christian, but I, I'm continually amazed at how God leads us to and through His Word, each and every book that we have studied in this church, how His providence has brought us to these places. And Jude, of course, is no exception as God has brought us to this book after studying Second Peter, because its message is, of course, timeless and it seems to have been written for our very day. As we have seen already, verse 3 of Jude's little epistle is the very theme. Verse 3 carries the theme of this entire letter. And it is a call for us as Christians to contend for the faith that has once for all, been delivered to the saints. Of course, by saints, Jude means those who are believers, the holy ones, the called out ones. He's not talking about icons of some false religion. He's talking about true believers. And that is simply to say that while Jude wrote these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit hundreds and hundreds of years ago, the message is for us today. It's for you and I as we sit here in the year 2021, and today within our world and within evangelicalism, we are in a war for the truth. We're in a war for the truth. I trust that you understand that. In fact, I was reminded once again even this morning of a church in the United States, in Tennessee, the church is called Grace Point Church, and yet this church says this about themselves. Speaking about the Bible, it says the Bible isn't the Word of God. The Bible isn't self-interpreting. It isn't a science book. It isn't an answer slash rule book. It is not inerrant or infallible. It goes on to say the Bible is a product of community, a library of texts, a multi vocal book, a human response to God, which is living and dynamic. We're at a war for truth. This is a church, a church in the United States. In fact, it becomes more and more evident each and every day that we are living as intolerance continues to masquerade as tolerance. You might be asking yourself, why? And the answer to that simply is this, because the mindset of today's tolerance is to tolerate any false claim and to be intolerant of any truth claim. In fact, we are finding out very quickly that there is no longer to be tolerated in any way, any kind of rightfully critical estimation of anything that is brought forth, unless you are critical of those who declare actual truth. It doesn't really matter what the subject is. It can be about the family. If you speak actual truth, you're not tolerated. It can be about gender, 
If you speak the truth about God's creation of man and woman in any kind of definitive and well-articulated way, you are not tolerated. If you speak truth about life and its beginning from the point of conception in the womb, you are not to be tolerated. In fact, even if you speak about the mundane realities of a children's book, you're not to be tolerated. You're to be canceled. If your message is contrary to the current and progressive worldview, then you are not to be heard. You are not to be tolerated in any kind of way. And what is becoming more disheartening is that the evangelical church at large is having difficulty with the very idea of standing against anything. I gave you that example simply to show you that this is in the church. In fact, the evangelical church today is beginning to toy with the question of truth and even asking, quote, is there actually people and ideologies and actions of others that God wants me to challenge. After all, isn't challenging anyone's thoughts and beliefs just unloving? Isn't it an unloving response to challenge others' views? Aren't we supposed to be loving? And doesn't that mean that we are to tolerate others? Well, even that kind of question carries a whole host of other questions that need to be asked. And yet, even on the surface, one of the implications from that type of question is the very real desire for the expressed action of patience and gentleness, right? I mean, even the very question says, aren't we supposed to just be patient and gentle? In other words, it's, it's true that every Christian is to live the, the life that is having those two godly virtues pulsating through the very veins of their life as they interact with others. We are to be patient and we are to be gentle. Aren't we to do that with all people? And yet, at the same time, God commands us as Christians to take a very serious and a very even severe, unbending, and at times unsympathetic approach to other worldviews, especially when the church is being threatened by that which is false. And anything that is unbiblical is false. Anything that is unbiblical is false. In fact, Paul put it this way in his letter to Titus. As he is exhorting him to, to set in place the overseers of the church. Here's what he said in Titus chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. An overseer, get this, must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. Why? So that he is able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also rebuke those who contradict it. Now right there is both the necessity for readiness and the reason for that readiness to give instruction. And that implies the impartation of truth, the giving of truth, the speaking of truth, and also to rebuke any contradiction. And that implies the challenging of error. In order to rebuke, you must challenge. You have to come against error. Now, why would this be so needed in the church? Why would it be so needed in the place that is the bride of Christ? Well, Paul goes on to tell Titus the reason. He says in verses 10 and 11, For there are many who are insubordinate. You say insubordinate. Okay, how is insubordinate being defined by the Apostle Paul and the original language there? 
Insubordinate is this. They're insubordinate. They are empty talkers. Empty talkers, that's the word. That means they talk senseless things, mischievous things. They, they wrangle. They're, they're vain talkers, worthless words. Deceivers, Paul says. They are empty talkers. They are deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party, he says. And that's those who promote justification by works. And then Paul says in verse 11, they must be silenced. Why? Why, Paul? Because they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. What's Paul saying then to Titus? He's saying, listen, Titus, the issue is so serious that the well-being of the church is at stake if you don't stand for the truth. In other words, the potential for damaging influence is so great that Jude says here in Jude verse 3, while I wanted to write to you about our common salvation, the glorious truths that, that we deal with in soteriology, all that we have in Christ, while I wanted to do that, exhorting all of us to contend for the faith was much more needed. In other words, this is so serious that we dare not close our ears to any of it. This is serious. There can be no toleration of willful deviation from the truth. Let me say that again. According to the Word of God, there can be no toleration for willful deviation from the truth. One degree off today is exponentially passed on over time to greater and greater degrees. So to do so, to allow error, willfully allow error, is to allow the church of Jesus Christ to be in grave danger. Therefore, we must fight for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. We must. Now, Last Lord's Day, we learned the ultimate fate of the false here in Jude's letter in verses 5 through 7. And what Jude is talking about is apostates. He's talking about those who have known and those who have intellectually embraced the truth, but they willfully reject it. And this morning, I want us to begin to look at the identity of the false. The identity of the false, which begins in verse 8. Now you remember back in verse 4, Jude identified them under this general term. He, he calls these apostates, you notice, ungodly people. Verse 4, for certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation ungodly persons, and then he defines that reality. In other words, those who are godly don't live like the false. Let's, let's just get that right out there right away. Those who are godly people don't live the way these ungodly live. Those who are of the truth don't, don't carry themselves like the false. They don't speak like the false, they don't believe like the false, and therefore the influence of the false in the church is so destructive. It's, it's like dynamite that's hidden underground. Why? Because they appear for a time, they appear for a time to be real, but in reality they're false. Jude shows us that they can be identified under four categories of arrogance. Four categories of arrogance. And as you know, you know me, we're not going to get very far, partly because of communion. At least that's what my heart's telling me. We're not going to get very far because communion's got to happen today, and we want to do that. But there's four categories of arrogance here, beginning in verse 8 and going all the way down to verse 13. Verse 13. 
And let me just list these for us, and then you can write them down as you will in your own outlines and notes. But number one is arrogant in their imaginations. Arrogant in their imaginations, that's verses 8 and 9. Verse 10 shows us arrogant in their ignorance. Arrogant in their ignorance. Verse 13, or I'm sorry, verse 11 They are arrogant in their determination, arrogant in their determination. And then verses 12 and 13, arrogant in their attendance, arrogant in their attendance. By attendance, I don't mean necessarily that they're in and among. I mean by their very life, their presence, who they are. So let me just read these verses for us so that we just kind of have this in our mind as we begin. Beginning in verse 8, yet in the same manner, these men. Now we understand what manner he's talking about. He's talking about the manner of those found in verses 5 through 7. The fate of those in the same way as those. The same way they acted. The same way they carried themselves. The same way they uh, abused the place that God had given them. The same way they had stood against authority. You'll notice we see that here. Yet in the same manner, these men also by dreaming defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these men revile the things which they do not understand, and the things which they know by instinct like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed." Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These men are those who are hidden reefs in your love feast when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves. They're clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead and uprooted. Wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam. Wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved. This is a very graphic description that Jude gives us of the false, the apostate. Those who have heard the truth, those who have understood the truth, those who have even latched on to the truth, but in the end have rejected the truth and turned back. It's shocking, really, that that happens. And yet, that very reality is truth. There have always been those who appear for a time to be God's people, and yet in the end, they reject Him who is the truth. They abandoned the true gospel. And because of that, we, knew, we know from our study of Hebrews some time ago, to do that, the writer of Hebrews says it's impossible for those who do that to once again come to repentance. You want to get into a stated condition where it's impossible to come to repentance, then get into the stated condition of being an apostate, knowing the truth, hearing the truth, embracing the truth, and rejecting the truth in the end. Why is it impossible? Because, the writer of Hebrews says, they've trampled underfoot the only thing that can can save them. They've trampled underfoot the blood of Christ. Listen, that is the only thing that can save, and if you throw the blood of Christ out, there's nothing to save. Of course, sadly, this is not a new phenomenon. There have always been godless rejectors who appear for a time to look godly. For example... Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Notice what God says to the nation of Israel in verse 15. 
But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You are grown fat, thick and sleek. And then he forsook God who made him and scorned the rock of his salvation. Now that word there, Jeshurun, is the word for Israel. It's Israel. Israel grew fat and, and kicked around. They were, they were healthy. They had grown fat. They had grown thick. God had provided wondrously for Israel. And yet they forsook God who made him and scorned the rock of salvation. Stunning, isn't it? Stunning that Israel... As a nation rejected the rock of salvation. Who is what? Who is that? That's Christ. That's Christ. Again, 1 Chronicles chapter 28. You don't have to turn there. If you want to, you can. But I'll just remind you of this. 1 Chronicles 28 verse 9. David says to his son Solomon this. Quote, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and a willing mind. Why? Because the Lord searches all hearts and understands every intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will let you find him. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. You see, there's a warning. There's a warning, it's eternally deadly to reject the truth. It's eternally deadly, after knowing the truth, to reject the truth. Of course, if you go over to Jeremiah, Jeremiah 17, just about the very middle of your Bible, Jeremiah 17 and verse 5. Thus says the Lord. Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength. And whose heart turns away from the Lord. What an indictment. What an indictment. Cursed is the man who trusts in men. You place your trust in the things of men or in men himself, cursed are you. You make flesh your strength. You, th you think you're something in your own personhood, in your own persona, in your own self. You think you're somebody, that that's your strength. You, your heart turns away from the Lord because in living that way, that's the reality. Cursed are you. Don't trust your heart. Look at verse 9. The heart is more deceitful than all things. It's desperately sick. Who can understand it? People say, I'm following my heart. I'm just following what, what I think's right. I'm just following my heart. Really? Don't follow your heart. It's desperately sick. You don't even understand it. It's the Lord who searches the heart. He tests the mind to give each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. And trust in yourself, shame on you. Or Ezekiel, or Ezekiel, Ezekiel 18. Notice what it says, verse 24, when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that a wicked man does, God says, will he live? Is he going to live? All his righteous deeds which he has done will not be remembered for his treachery which he has committed and his sin which he has committed. For them he will die. What's God saying? What's God saying to the nation of Israel? He's saying, listen, all of the outward show of righteousness, all of the outward acts of looking like you're righteous, of living, quote unquote, this righteous life is meaningless if in the end you reject him who is truth. If you reject him who is righteousness, what does it mean that you tried to strive to live some kind of righteous life? And your rejection is not an outward rejection in appearance, 
an outward rejection in the way you live because you reject Christ. That's what he's saying. In other words, in the end, if your actions and by your actions you turn from Christ, then your outward appearance of righteousness was just that. Outward only. It was outward only. And that kind of person shows that they were truly never saved. They're just one of the false. I was thinking about, about that, reminded of our study of the Gospel of John in John chapter 6. Thousands of people were outwardly following Jesus. Thousands and thousands of people wanted to follow Jesus. And yet they stopped following him. They turned away. They rejected him. Why? Because he wouldn't fulfill their whims. He wouldn't fulfill their desires. He was contrary to what they wanted. And so they didn't tolerate him anymore. And so Jesus turns to the twelve, those whom he had chosen, and he asks them if they're going to leave him also. Peter makes this truthful statement. He says, to whom shall we go? You, implying you only, you and you only have the words of life. You realize the sad reality of that very moment in time was that Judas was standing right there with them. Judas was standing right there. He turned to the twelve. Judas was one of them. He's standing right there. Judas is still following. The thousands have already turned their back and Judas is still playing the game. He's standing with them, but he was false. It's the reality of falseness, apostasy. It's throughout the Bible. It's a defection from the truth. Defection from the truth. Not necessarily in word, but certainly in deed. In other words, it's willful rejection of the truth that is heard and known. Willful. As we turn back to Jude, verse 8. This is the very character and nature of the false. And of course, the judgment that awaits the false is eternal fire, eternal darkness. For all who reject, the, the, the damnation that is coming is pictured there for us in verses 5 through 7. Their fate is coming. They're not going to get away with it forever. And in verses 8 through 13, he tells us why. Jude tells us why here in verses 8 through 13. So I just want to begin with this first one, the arrogance of their imagination in verses 8 and 9. This is a fascinating text because it shows just that reality in them, the arrogance of the imagination. I was reading one commentator this week as I was studying. He said, this is unholy, insane boldness. I like that. Unholy, insane boldness. Why? Because just like the Israelites who came out of Egypt, they were under the care of God. They had seen all the miracles of God right before their very eyes. They had crossed the Red Sea on dry land, just like all of them who were now going to die in the desert, rejecting the care of God for them. Just like the angels who left their proper place, rejecting God, following after their own sinful desires. And just like verse 7, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah who refused to listen to the truth that Lot had spoke to them and pursued their own wickedness, so too, he says, these very false disciples, every apostate just like them has the same arrogant imagination. They follow after their own thinking. They follow after their own imaginations. Notice how Jude puts it here. He says, yet in the same manner these men also by dreaming defile the flesh. 
also by dreaming defile the flesh. These men in like manner. In other words, they're just like those who have gone before. They were just like Israel of old. They're just like the angels who now are kicked out of the glories of heaven. In fact, held under darkness until the day of judgment. They're just like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah who faced in fury of God's wrath and eternal fire. So too, these Men are just like that. They follow after their own, notice, dreams. In other words, the fantasy of their own thinking. It's the fantasy of their own mind. He's not talking about dreams like you and I might have during sleep. That's not what he's talking about. Sometimes we, our minds in our subconscious state goes places and seems so real and yet it's not that's not the word that's used here that word is used in the scriptures but that's not the word that's used here this is a completely different word this word that's used here is used only one other place in scripture it's in the new testament and i want you to turn there go back to acts chapter 2 Just me saying that text ought to conjure up in your mind some ideas as to what the meaning of this word is. Acts chapter 2 and verse 17 is where we find this word being used in the New Testament along with here in Jude verse 8. All right, Peter is giving his sermon on the day of Pentecost. Jesus Christ has been murdered a few days before. The Jesus has risen, the Spirit has come, and Peter is giving this sermon concerning the Spirit that has been poured out upon the believers and all those who are in the area are hearing them speak to them in their own native tongue, even though these people have never studied their own, these other people's native tongue ever again or ever before. They have no prior knowledge of their tongues of these people from the dispersion who have come into the city of Jerusalem for the grand festival. And here is Peter now standing up on this day. And in chapter 2, verse 17, notice what he says. This is spoken about, right? He begins in verse 11. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel, right? Peter says, listen, You don't have to consider this some kind of craziness that these people all got together, conjured up, pulled out the best kind of bottles of wine and all have been drinking since the early mornings. That's ridiculous. They're not drunk. It has nothing to do with that. This is about what Joel spoke of in his prophecy. And he quotes Joel 2, 28 and 29. What's it say there? Well, here's what Joel says. It shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour pour forth my spirit upon all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. There's the word. The word in Jude is the same word used right here by Peter as he's quoting Joel's prophecy, and it's not the normal word for dreams. The word being used here is a word that links it to visions or to revelatory visions and dreams and prophecies. In other words, this is a word used of those who receive direct relation or revelation from God. So the Holy Spirit, now go back to Jude, the Holy Spirit is inspiring Jude to write this, and the Holy Spirit is being very careful to use the specific word, this very specific word that was used back in Acts chapter 2 verse 17 that Peter was using, which was really the prophecy of Joel from the Old Testament. He's using this specific word because it's connected to those kinds of dreams which... <laughs> 
by the prophecy of Joel and the preaching of Peter in Acts chapter 2 have to do with receiving the actual divine word of God. And so what is Jude telling us here about these apostates, these false ones? He's telling us that these false people are those who always say that God is communicating with them personally. They are those who go around and flaunt their imaginations and say, God told me. I was reading an expose recently of a book that someone has written. in which he explains how he got the information for this book. This is a man who claims to know God, a man who is leading a church. He said this, In 2017, God asked me to start writing a novel. Now that's novel. God asked me. He said, I, I didn't know why. I'm not a novelist, nor am I inclined to read novel, novels. He said, I'm a shy, pragmatic, math and science oriented business owner. I don't read novels, I, I read business stuff and leadership topics. And yet in 2008, when I finally let Jesus into my life, my reading material changed to just the Bible and scripture commentary. So when God asked me to write a novel in 2017, it seemed silly to me, and rightly so. However, the one thing I love most about my life is watching God work through me and others, so I agreed to start writing a novel as he instructed. And my writing method, here it is, here's how I, here's how I learned how to write what I wrote. My writing method was to pray and seek his guidance and then move forward writing what I heard. God talks to me. And whatever I hear him say, I write it down. In fact, in this little expose, he writes that sentence and then says, repeat. So read that again. And he says, sometime over the next 12 months, this book that I wrote came alive, get this, in my imagination. Yep. Yes, it's your imagination. God didn't speak to you at all. You didn't hear from God because God doesn't speak in that way to us anymore. He spoke through the prophets and in times past spoke through dreams and visions. And yet in these last days, he has spoken to us in his son. You say, where do you get that, Pastor? Hebrews chapter 1, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways in these last days, has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. Here's what Jude is telling us. False people are those who always say that God is communicating with them personally. That he speaks to them and with them. That they have dreams and visions. And in them God speaks directly with them. And why do they say this? Why is it that they would say such an outlandish thing? I'll tell you why. Because it removes them from any potential scrutiny. I mean, after all, if God talks personally with me, then you better listen, right? Right? They have been supposedly given something new, something fresh, something that isn't here in the scriptures. And yet we hear the scriptures say that we have everything we need for life and godliness. 
But the false come along and they say, oh, you can trust me. God talks to me. They can't just say, look, I feel like this is right. They can't just say, well, well, I think, I, I, I think this is the way it goes. No, they have to say, thus says God, especially when they say something that contradicts what the Bible clearly teaches. It has to be, thus says God, because who's going to listen to it if it isn't from that? If they don't say that, no one's going to believe them. And so they say, God told me. Oh, really? How? In a dream. In a dream. And so what is Jude saying? He's helping us. He's helping us discern that the false arrogantly follow their own imaginations. Arrogantly follow their own imaginations. They base their lies on fantasies of their own darkened thoughts. They claim to speak for God. They claim that God told them something. And because of that, you better listen. You say, is that really happening? Yeah. Mormonism. Joseph Smith received a vision and wrote it all down. We could go so far as to say all of false religion, even Catholicism is born out of the imaginations of men, the philosophies of men. All of them are unwilling to come under the authority of God's word. All of them reject the authority of God, the once for all delivered to the saints word of God. That's why Jude says here in verse 8, they reject authority. This is why they can live the way they live. This is why they could easily accommodate their life to live the way they do in Sodom and Gomorrah because it, it accommodates their own sinful flesh. They defile the flesh through their own imaginations. It's okay to have marriages that are of the same sex in the church. Why? Because God told me it's okay. We're just supposed to love and accept that. No. No, that's not what the Word of God says. They reject authority. Now go for a moment over to Deuteronomy chapter 13. Deuteronomy chapter 13. Because this passage comes to mind when I hear people say, God told me. And then they began to speak what God supposedly said, even when it contradicts what the Bible says. Notice what God says to Israel in verse 13, or chapter 13. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder. You can stop right there for a moment. So here's the people of God. If a prophet comes, someone who says, God, I'm, I'm, I'm here on behalf of God, or a dreamer of dreams, someone who says, I, I had a vision, I need to speak this, this is from God, and he comes among you, and as we know from the New Testament, this is not, not out of the ordinary, there, there's false that enter into the church, this is why it's so important that we contend for the faith. And then he says, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying. So now here's the situation is even more highlighted. You've got a, 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 a person who's claiming that God spoke to them, and then in some kind of way they're showing a sign that is here intent for all intents purposes to be a miraculous sign you say can that happen yes yes it can happen i mean if the false if they're false and if the phraseology verbiage words and 
message of it is false, then can it come to fruition that they do a sign? That's the question that we come to our minds. Can that really happen? I, I mean, is it true? The answer is yes. Why? Why could that be so? Well, because of who's truly behind the lie. Satan's behind the lie. Satan appears as an angel of light. Satan can counterfeit things. And so here he says, look, they're showing you a sign or a wonder, and it comes true concerning which he spoke to you. So concerning the message, he speaks this message, and, and then he shows you a sign, and, and now you're going, okay, well, it sounds rather interesting to me, and yet you show a sign, and yet here's the message, let us go after other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them. So now here's the lesson, right? He, he comes in and he says, look, I have something from God to tell you, and here's the message. The message from God is that we go after other gods which you did not hear about, and here, I'll prove it to you, it's from God, here's a sign to show you that I'm the real deal. You know, man, that's pretty serious. I mean, how am I gonna, how am I gonna figure this out? How am I gonna figure this out? Notice what Deuteronomy says. He says, "You shall not listen to the words of that prophet, verse three, or that dreamer of dreams. Don't listen to it." Oh, wait a minute. What? What? He spoke something. He said it was from you, God, and then he showed this miracle. Yeah, well, don't you dare follow it because he's actually rejecting me. He's being insubordinate to me. He is ungodly. Notice, even if that sign comes true, you don't listen to it. Why? Because... The Lord God is testing you. The Lord God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. The very first commandment of the Ten Commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. There is no other God before me, right? You should love him. That's the summation of, of the first commandments. And then the second is love your neighbor as yourself. This is God testing you. So think about it. Think about how serious it is. Think about Learning you must be, someone says, God said to us to do this, and even though they show an apparent sign from God, and yet the teaching is contrary to the known word of God. We have the canon of scripture. We have everything we need for life and godliness. We take every thought captive to the word of God. We don't take every action captive because they might be falsified. They might do something that seems rather grand and they say it's from God. But if it contracts, if the message is contrary to the word of God, God says don't follow it. Don't follow it. Why? Because I'm testing you. About what? To see if you actually love me. See if you fear me as you proclaim. You see, because anyone who's real, anyone who is not false will never turn from the truth. Why? Because you don't hold yourself there. God does. You're secure in the hand of God. You want to know what held the martyrs to the stake as the flame was being lit? It wasn't their moxie. It wasn't their strength. It was God holding them there. Listen, had, if God was not sustaining us every minute of every day, each and every one of us this day would turn from God right now. But God is sustaining us. God is holding us. And even if the false seems so real, but they're contrary to God himself, you don't follow it. Why? Because God never contradicts himself. God never contradicts himself. Listen, beloved, you follow a false prophet and you have proven you have proven that you do not love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. 
Listen, contending for the faith is deadly serious, isn't it? Contending for the faith is deadly serious. Back in Deuteronomy, it says, You shall follow the Lord your God and fear Him, and you shall keep His commandments, listen to His voice, serve Him, and cling to Him. Deuteronomy 13, verse 4. Cling to Him. It's deadly serious. And so Jude says, listen, you can't follow after the dreamers. They are arrogant in their imaginations, and the end is deadly. All you need is to turn to the word of God once for all delivered to the saints. We have a completed word of God. We need nothing else. There is no continuing revelation from God. If you in your own heart have heard voices that you claim are from God, you need to rethink the voice that you heard. Do not rethink God. Because there is no continuing revelation from God. We all have all that we need for life and godliness. Now turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 4 just to have us prepare ourselves for communion time. 1 Timothy chapter 4, just listen to what Paul says to Timothy. First Timothy 4, 1 Timothy 4.1, but the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will fall away from the faith. Well, how are they doing that? They're paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Well, how are those coming in? By means of the hypocrisy of liars who are steered in their own conscience as with a branding iron. Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude, for it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. Timothy, in pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following. So have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, you discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Because bodily discipline is only for little profit. But godliness is profitable for all things since it holds promise for the present life and also the life to come. So it's a trustworthy statement, Timothy, deserving full acceptance. For if it is for this we labor and strive, it is, for it is for this we labor and strive because we have fixed our hope on the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. So prescribe and teach these things. Beloved, this is what we do here. This is what we stand for here. This is what we, God willing in our hearts, will never waver from in this place. So what have we learned? What have we learned? Well, we have learned that we are to beware of those people who are dreamers. Beware of those that say that God is speaking to them in their dreams or in some other way. In the reality, they are fabricating out of their own minds their own view of everything. Be on guard. Be on guard lest you be led astray. Know the word of God and trust it with all your heart. Trust it with all your heart. That's what we've learned thus far. Well, we'll return to this next time and we'll continue on. Try to get through verse 8 and 9 at least. Would you pray with me as we prepare our hearts for communion? Heavenly Father, sobering words this morning for us.
a challenge to our hearts, a challenge to our very lives. Not an impossible challenge because you have given us all we need for life and godliness. And therefore, we must saturate ourselves in your word. Be saturated in the rightly divided truth so that when the false come, we can easily say, no, we're not following that. Away from here. So that we can help others when those times come. Lord, you're such a gracious God to us. Not because we deserve it, but simply because your very nature and character have shown yourself to be. We don't deserve anything that you give us, and yet you have given us so much. Why? Because of Christ. And so as we prepare our hearts for our time around the communion table, Lord, I pray that we would be genuine in our hearts before you. Lord, we understand that we sin. We're not talking about perfection here. But we want to follow your truth. We want to follow you. And that means that we have to challenge ourselves. We have to look at ourselves and see these areas where we are subtly or even overtly and covertly dishonoring your name. Thank you for the protection and surety we have in Jesus Christ and him alone. So Lord, as we prepare our hearts for communion, may you allow us to get a glimpse of any area in us that may not be right before you. We certainly don't want to take the communion elements in an unworthy way. So pray that we would check our hearts as we prepare. In Christ's name we pray, amen.